right? So let us now look at spatial derivatives. Right. Let us look at, um, let us start as, as before with, with our scalars, right. So let us suppose now that we have alpha um, as before function of position and time, okay. Um, what I am going to do now is that because we have already looked at how to take derivatives with respect to time, I am not going to worry too much about that and I'm going to focus only upon the spatial dependence, okay. Uh, what that says is that now, now let's just suppose that we have the scalar which is a function of position, right. Um, we know that we are going to work with the basis, right. One may ask what could alpha as a function of position represent? We may consider something like, you know, alpha equals alpha of x uh, comma t and we may say, well, what if I were to try and represent a surface using alpha, right? So maybe I have some surface here, right? Right, that is my attempt to represent a surface, right, in three-dimensional space. And in particular, you, you, may, you may recall from your earlier study of calculus, um, that one way in which to represent that surface may be to say that alpha, right, function of x and t equals some constant c, right, c represents a constant, that is the locus of that surface, right, so that surface is alpha okay. All right, so when we restrict those values to C, we get that surface, right. The reason for doing that is now if I talk in terms of spatial derivatives, it gives us a nice interpretation for certain spatial derivatives, okay. Uh, specifically, what one can talk about is uh, this following idea. The first kind of spatial derivative we are going to look at is simply the gradient of alpha, okay. This gradient of alpha will be written as grad alpha, okay. That is our notation for it, right, grad, that, that symbol is actually the Greek letter nabla, okay, right. So we will call this gradient of alpha or just refer to it as grad alpha, right. Uh, this is written in the following fashion, right. What we mean when we write grad alpha is the following. We are talking of taking derivatives of alpha with respect to x i, okay, right, and multiplying them by our basis vectors e i, okay. The sum over i is implied, right, and that is how we write out the gradient of alpha. Note that we started out with alpha being a scalar, but now when we compute its gradient, it is a vector, okay. So gradient of alpha is this, and of course this belongs to R3, okay. Now, how is that relevant here how, how, or how do we represent it in this, in this figure that I drew here? Though I wrote, wrote that surface out as being a constant, we may, we, we can think of that surface uh, being constant really being the surface of, of some body, right. In that case, we can uh, consider computing the gradient of alpha and what we would see is that the gradient of alpha would be that perpendicular, okay. So alpha equals c is the surface, okay. Gradient of alpha is that vector, okay. Of course, the surface itself is a constant, so you may wonder how can you compute its gradient or its gradient has got to be zero if the surface itself uh, is equal to a constant c. But the idea is that that surface is only the surface, think of it as the surface of a body. Right, so on the inside of the body, right, maybe on the maybe below the surface, so maybe this, maybe the surface extends out in three dimensions down here, right? Okay, so alpha equals c is the actual surface, but if you were to come to the surface from the inside, you could compute this gradient, right? Could compute this gradient, right? And 
we know that when you reach the surface, the value of that gradient would be directed along the normal to that surface. Right? So this is an interpretation of uh, gradient alpha. And the reason I chose that particular interpretation in terms of that surface is to uh, remind ourselves that indeed gradient of alpha is a vector. Okay? All right. Uh, we can go ahead now and uh, talk about what happens with, with the scalar. Okay? So, so let, let me just remind ourselves that when we were talking about alpha being a scalar here by saying gradient of alpha belongs to R. Okay? All right. Now let's talk in terms of spatial derivatives of vectors. And of course, these have to be vector fields, right? We do need them to depend upon position x in order to compute their spatial derivatives. Okay, so as before, we have u of x comma t belongs to R3. Just as we did for the scalars, we can talk of the gradient of the vector Okay, we will write it as grad u, right, using the same Greek letter nabla. And by this, we mean the following, right. We are now talking of taking gradients, and we'll write that in coordinate not notation as a derivative with respect to xj of u, right. But u itself, remember, is ui ei right, because itself is a vector, okay. Now, however, the gradient we saw before when we applied it to, the, to a scalar also introduces this fur, further, this further um, uh, aspect of uh, a vectorial field to it, right. So, we have here okay, here we understand this right, partial with respect to xj, ej as representing the gradient operator, okay, all right. So now, we saw that we saw on the previous uh, slide, we saw right here that u belongs to R3, it's a vector. What is the nature of this gradient of u? Is it a scalar, vector, or a tensor? Think about it for a second. The answer is actually staring you in the, staring at you right there, right? It should be clear here that this is a tensor, right? It's a tensor of order two, and that is clear by the fact that we have two indices here, u, i, and x, j, right? Now, because we know that E itself is independent of position, when we carry out this derivative, there are no derivatives to be taken of the basis vectors, okay? So we can write this very simply as partial of Ui with respect to Xj, right? Ei tensor Ej, okay? very clear now that this is indeed a tensor, right? In fact, we have right here our um, representation of grad u in terms of its components. The components of grad u are simply partial of ui with respect to xj, right? And then it's multiplied by that tensor product ei ej, ei tensor ej, and we have the sum over i and j, okay? Completely clear. We have the representation in terms of coordinate notation, okay? Now, as you know, once we have, we have the gradient defined, we can go ahead and define um, other sort of special types of derivatives, right? In particular, you know from here, we can define the divergence of a vector. Right? So, uh, there are various ways in which it will be written. Sometimes you, you will find div u uh, or del dot u, okay? Uh, and 
which is written here as simply partial of u i with respect to x i. All right. Now, something you may know is the fact that this is simply the trace of the gradient tensor. Okay? That should be very clear simply because here the I index is repeated. Right? So, so to make that more clear, what I could do is also uh, remind ourselves that if we were to write this gradient of U in matrix notation, right, is it is basically U1, comma 1, U1, comma 2, u1 comma 3, u2 comma 2, u2 comma 1, 2 comma 3, u3 comma 1, u3 comma 2, u3 comma 3. Okay? And clearly now, when we, when we talk about the divergence of u, We've written it here as partial of ui with respect to xi because the i is repeated. There is a sum implied over i. Well, it's very clearly just the trace here. Okay? You see the trace sitting right here. Okay? All right. The other kind of special derivative operator that works on uh, vectors is the curl. Okay? And of course, u is a function of position and time. All right? So, again, this is written in various ways. You may sometimes see curl u or using this <clears throat> gradient operator idea, you may see del cross u. Right? Now, the way we write this out is the following. This is what we mean by, 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 by the curl of u. We mean partial of uj with respect to xi, epsilon i, j, k. Epsilon, remember, is our permutation symbol, ek. All right? And you will see that this works out very well if you just treat the del operator as a vector operator. Okay? Um, so let me just write this here. We think of that as a vector operator. Right? And we mean that when we, when we write this, we are thinking of the following operation. Okay? You apply this operation, this, this vector operator, to you, and you get what we have there for the curl. Okay? This works perfectly fine, by the way, if you, you know, you know, you, you know this other equivalent way of writing it using this idea of, of, of the determinant, right? So equivalent, this is equivalent to writing determinant of the following matrix, right? We have here E1, E2, E3, um, partial with respect to X1, Partial with respect to x2, partial with respect to x3. Uh, here we have u1, u2, u3, and we close that, right? And the fact that it works out is, should be is something that we should be reminded of by the fact that we have here this permutation symbol 
which was also involved in the definition of the determinant. Okay? All right. Let's move on to tensors then. We can define all these spatial derivative operators on tensors. The one that is most common and that we will use most often is the divergence of a tensor. And therefore, that's the, that's the one that I will define here. Okay, so again, it would be writ it can be written. Uh, you may see it being written as divergence of A, or del dot A. Okay, this is equal to the following: derivative with respect to x j of A i j e i. Okay. Note that the divergence of a tensor is a vector. Okay, that should be clear by the fact that there is a single index i that is being contracted out with our basis vector index i here. Right? J has already been contracted out as a sum here, right? With with, with the derivative operator. Okay? So this object belongs to R3. All right. Okay. We're going to stop here for this segment.